Hebrews chapter 1, the first three verses. God, who at sundry times and in divers manners spake in times past unto the fathers by the prophets, hath in these last days spoken unto us by his Son, whom he hath appointed heir of all things, by whom he also made the worlds, and who being the brightness of his glory and the expressed image of his person, and upholding all things by the word of his power, when he had himself purged our sins, sat down on the right hand of the majesty on high. I want to go to the Lord in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you. We praise you, God, for your mercy, your grace, and your goodness this morning. We thank you, Father, for these precious people that have come out on this Sunday morning, those who have joined us via social media, those who will join us later. God, I thank you that you've given me this word to minister. Lord, I thank you for your anointing. I thank you for your strength. I thank you, Father, for strength in my leg and healing in my body, God. I thank you, Father, in Jesus' name, for making it easy to speak, God. Thank you for receptive hearts. Thank you for hearing ears to your word, God. Thank you for helping us be doers of your word, God. We thank you, Father, for it in the precious and mighty and majestic name of the Lord Jesus Christ. And everybody said? Amen, amen, amen. amen. Uh, the title of my message this morning is Come Back to the Word. And uh, before we get into the message today, I, I want to preface what I'm about to say with this thought. I, I think this thought will be the thing that we need to grasp a hold of, which will be the, 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 the pivot point of the whole message. I think if we are honest that we would say that really throughout life, this should be at the fourth thought of our thinking. That which we meditate on the most is what will become magnified in our lives. I want you to think about that. That which we meditate on the most is what we will uh, become magnified in our lives. And with that thought, I want to start sharing what I believe God would have us to glean from this morning. And that is that God has always desired to reveal himself to mankind from the beginning. And when, as we take a look at the book of Hebrews, uh, I, I believe that Paul is the author of the book of Hebrews. There's a lot of people that speculate, maybe Barnabas, maybe someone else wrote the book of Hebrews. They say, because the book of Hebrews is a real polished epistle. They said that Paul didn't write in that form of Greek and that style. But Paul was a member of the Sanhedrin. He was, a, he was an educated man, and he was writing uh, to the church at Jerusalem. Now, to think about this, the church of Jerusalem, what's important to understand, my friend, is that the church of Jerusalem is where the church began. Amen? Jesus died, you know, around 33 A.D., roughly, give or take a year. The, this book, it has been estimated, was written 63, 65 A.D., just five to eight years, depending on how you place it, with the fall of Jerusalem and Jesus foretold that in the book of Matthew talked about that 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 the temple would be destroyed and not one stone would uh, would remain that it would all be torn down but I want you to think about this the place where the church started where the Holy Ghost fell and they spoke in other tongues the tongue talking kind of Holy Ghost <laughs> baptism okay the tongue talking kind that place is where revival started and people were saved. Yet just 30 years later, and there's a whole lot of reasons for it. We're not, we don't really have time to go in, all in, into that, but it's a, it's a very interesting study for reasons that, plagued, that have plagued the church throughout the ages. And if we allow them, can, uh, can plague the church today. And I'm not talking about this particular body, so to speak but I'm talking about the church at whole. They get into a ditch. Now in life and in the gospel, there are two ditches. You know, when you travel down the road, there's two ditches, right? There's one to the left and one to the right. Well, when it comes to the things of God, there are two ditches that we can fall into. And the first ditch is the one that the church at Jerusalem fell into, and it was the ditch of tradition. Amen? It was the church that fell into just, well, this is the way we've always done it. And they got so organized that they organized the Holy Ghost right out of their service. And they were in danger 
and, and bringing back things from the old covenant to try to implement that in the church. And the Apostle Paul, and I'm going to refer to the Apostle Paul for the sake of this sermon as the author of the book of Hebrews. The Apostle Paul saw this and he wanted to correct some things. Now the ditch on the other side, and we got to be careful for that, is fanaticism and excess and twisting the word of God and adding things. And so we can't get in the ditch on either side. We got to remain well balanced, my friend. Well balanced. I, I remember uh, back in 1996 when my wife and I, we got married just probably three or four months after that. Uh, we went up, Pastor Dale and Sister Sharon, and God bless their hearts, you know, he gave me the opportunity to preach when no one would have, should have had anything to do with me. I was a drunk and doing all sorts of other things. But when I came back to the Lord and I was going through uh, licensing for credentials, we went up to South Bend, Indiana, and Pastor Billy Joe Darty, who passed, uh, went on to be with the Lord uh, back in November of 2009. Uh, he, he was speaking that morning, and one of the things he talked about, he quoted the, the verse, and, and the verse that he quoted was, to be well balanced, for that enemy of yours is like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. You know the scripture, right? And we, through the ages, have said, well, he's like a roaring lion. Jesus, when he died upon the cross, he, he was crucified. He kicked the teeth in of the devil, and that's true, isn't it? That when he roars, really all you've got is a little kitten going, meow. He wants you to think he's bigger and badder. And that's true legally. How many of you know that's true legally? Amen? But how many of you know he turned around and said, even though it's true legally, there's still a lot of believers getting devoured by the enemy. And the reason for that is, is because they're not maintaining well balance. They're not getting the word of God in them. And if anything, I want you, and I believe God would instill in us that we get the word of God in us. We're living in a time and we're living in a day, my friend, in which the world is crazy. Amen? I mean, it's crazy. We live in a time and a day that's like no other. 29 years ago when I came back to the Lord was a different time than it is now. Different time 20 years ago, 10 years ago, even five years ago. There have been a lot of things trans, transpire in this, in this world. And this also could be to you grandparents to watch out because your kids are facing things that we never thought they would face. Encourage them, love them, but instruct them in, to, in the things of the Lord. My friend, we've got to be on guard for the tricks of the enemy. Amen? The Bible here says in the first verse, God who at sundry times and in diverse manners spake and time passed unto the fa uh, uh, fathers by the prophets. The first part of that verse. Uh, in the Greek, and I'm not a Greek, uh, 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 I, I'm not, you know, I'm not all that well-versed in Greek. I'm not even all that well-versed in English, but... Uh, <laughs> I'll do my best. Uh, sundry times in the Greek is a word polymetros. It means various portions and at various times. Divers manners in the Greek is polytropos. They're very similar words in the Greek. It means methods and forms. And so James Moffat in the Moffat's translation, he says of this verse, many were the forms and fashions in which God spoke of old to our fathers by the prophets. Folks, the word of God, God revealing himself to humanity is contained within the pages of this leather-bound book. This is God's word to you. It's the revelation of himself to us. Amen? And the apostle Paul writing by unction of the Holy Ghost said in times past, God spoke in many different forms and different fashions. In other words, he spoke in many different ways. He moved on holy men of old and they wrote under the unction of the Holy Ghost. 
But he did it over the span of four, four millennium through people who the only connection that they had was through the blood covenant through Abraham. But many of them, generation after generation, they had no personal knowledge of the other person. Yet we know that there's a harmony of the scriptures, that not one scripture contradicts another scripture over 4,000 years. Now, you'll, you'll find people, you'll find scoffers that say, well, what about this? It says that over there. That is where we have to study to show ourselves approved of a workman not being ashamed, rightly dividing the word of God. If we can rightly divide the word of God by inference, we can wrongly divide the word of God. Amen? And we've got to be ready, my friend, for that when trouble and trials and sickness and disease, we've got to get the word of God in us. When scoffers try to, 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 to set you astray, we need to be grounded in the word of God. The Bible tells us, and we, we may take a look at this scripture a little bit later, that there are many voices, in the, but none of them are without signification. The Bible talks about that we are the sheep and we have a shepherd. And the Bible says that my sheep know my voice. And the picture that that paints is that in old days, during these times, that there would be shepherds that would gather their flock and maybe there would be several flock of shepherds together in one pasture of land. Maybe they took them to feed, maybe they took them to water, maybe they took them to exercise, whatever, but they, there'd be several. And that shepherd, toward the end of the day, would start calling for his sheep. And all the sheep that belonged to that shepherd would go to him. The other shepherd, because they didn't, they didn't recognize that voice. They wouldn't follow that shepherd. My friend, the world is full of many voices to distract us. It is full of many things to take our eye off the prize. We got to be able to have our, our spiritual antennas up where we are fine tuned to the clarion call of the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. Amen. We've got to know that uh, we've got to know the truth and stand upon the truth because the enemy is out to destroy, to destroy us, to destroy you. But we're not going to let him because we're coming back to the word. Amen. We're standing upon the word. Hallelujah. Praise you, Jesus. The Amplified says of the same scripture says in many separate revelations, each set forth a portion of the truth. And in many ways, God spake of old to our forefathers in and by the prophets. And so the apostle Paul is writing that, and he's referring to the Old Testament here, that it set forth a portion of the truth. It is truth. Now, let me, let me just share this, you know, especially in the light of hyper grace, which is, I, I don't, I'm not hearing as much about it now. I'm sure it's still out there. Uh, but in the light of hyper grace, I, I heard people actually say from a pulpit, they wish that the Old Testament had never been written. Yeah, I've heard that. I've heard that. You know what you do when you hear some garbage like that? Turn over and watch the Beverly Hillbillies. You'll get more, <laughs> you'll get more out of that than you will that garbage. Okay? Watch Andy, Barney, okay? You'll get more revelation from Andy and Barb than, and Barney than, than, than you will from that. Listen, the Old Testament is the Word of God. Amen? God wrote, and he wrote it, the Old Testament, over a span of 4,000 years. It is the Word of God. Now, the Apostle Paul says it's a portion of the Word of God. It's not all the truth, but it is truth, right? The Old Testament and everything in the Old Testament points to the first coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. Everything in the New Testament will point to his second coming. Amen? It's all about Jesus. It's all about him. And so, although we can learn a lot of things, I mean, the old covenant was good. You get healed under the old covenant. Amen? You could be blessed under the old covenant. You'd be protected under the old covenant. It was good. But the theme of the book of Hebrews is what? Better. 
I don't know about you, but when I go and I start looking for something I see good and better and best, I want best, amen? In this, in, in this, in this instance, we got good and we got better. Between good and better, I'm going to take better. I don't know about you, amen? Because it is through the new covenant and the words written in the New Testament that bring the total light of what God was trying to say in the Old Testament. Amen? God revealing himself to us through his word. The second part of Hebrews chapter 1 says, Hath in these last days spoken unto us by his Son. Now let me ask you a question. When did the last days begin? Acts 2.17. When did the last days begin? You may say, well, well Brother James, I, I know when the last days begun. The last days begun when Israel was founded in 1948. Well, that's part of it. I, I know when the last days was. The last days began uh, about 15 years ago when it really seemed like that the United States was going crazy. Well, that's part of it. But let's take a look at what the Bible says hath in these last days. What is he talking about? He's talking about the church age. The church was founded on the day of Pentecost. When did the last days begin? It began in these last days. He spoke unto us his son, whom he hath appointed heir of all things by whom he made the worlds. The last days began at the dawn of the church age. And we are in what we would say the last of the last of the last of the last days. And he said in these last days spoken to us by his son, going back to Hebrews chapter 1 verse 2, hath, uh, 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 he says, whom he hath appointed heir of all things, by whom also he made the world. Now here's the thing about airship. Airship in order to be an heir to something, you have to be born. There's what is known as, in theological circles as the hypostatic union. And the hypostatic union basically is when God became man. Jesus emptied himself of his deity and was born of the virgin and became flesh. He became flesh. He was 100% God and 100% man. Amen? He emptied himself. The humanity of him hungered and thirst while the God in him fed the multitude. The humanity in him enjoyed a marriage feast when the God in him, portion of him, turned the water into wine. He's 100% God, 100% man. And heirship is determined at birth. God was, a, 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 the Lord Jesus Christ was appointed heirship because he was born. And because he was born, man sinned, a man had to die. But he had to be perfect and he had to be sinless. And that was the God part of him. The Bible says in John 1.1, 1, 1, in the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God. I'll ask you another question. If you don't know, that's fine. But do you know what the word, word in the Greek is? That's logos. It's the written word. See, Jesus was eternally present as the word from eternity past with the Father. I know I was in the third grade, and I don't know how I got off on this subject. We, 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 we were out for recess. We was coming back in, and I spoke to my third grade teacher. I said, did you know that Jesus was always present with God the Father? Third grade, she looked at me and said, no, God created Jesus. No, Jesus is not, Jesus is not some created being. He is God. Along with the Father and along with the Holy Ghost, they have been around since eternity past. Amen? He was known pre-incarnate as the Word. I'm going somewhere. I'm plowing. And when we're done plowing, and digging a footer and plowing, laying this foundation, we're going to take off real quick. 
The Bible is the written word. Jesus is the living word. The Bible says that Jesus said, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. I do only those things that I see my Father do. The Bible says that the Spirit and the Word agree. That the Spirit of God will never do anything to, con to, to, to conflict with the words of this book. If you see something going on and it does not line up with the words of this book, you can throw it away. My, wi I, 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 my wife and I, we were having lunch. It's been about a month ago. We were having lunch and somebody came to our table and uh, uh, I want to be careful how I say this. Uh, people that said it aren't here. So, uh, But they, because they, I don't want to hurt anybody, okay? But I think it's important to understand. They, they asked me, they said, where did the devil come from? And I said, well, iniquity was found in his heart. That's what the Bible says. And he looked at me and he said, straight face. That's the biggest lie in the Bible. And we went, what? And he said, I'm reading this book. And my wife just speaks up and says, well, I'll choose the Bible over your book. Good answer. Final answer. Is that your final answer? It's my final answer. You win the million dollars or whatever the big prize is. You win eternity in heaven. How about that? That's better than a million dollars, amen? amen? When somebody comes at you with something, you better have something in here to be able to speak back. I mean, it's a shame that people that call themselves Christians get off into the ditch. Come back to the word, amen? amen. You'll never go wrong with the word, amen? You'll never go wrong with listening to Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, amen? Someone tries to tell you something, say, well, you know what? I was reading John the other day. You know what John told me? And he was one of the inner circle of Jesus, the disciple whom Jesus loved. He referred to himself in the third person. I think John may know a little bit more about Jesus than even you and I might, amen? I was, I was, I, I, I was you, someone comes up to you and says, well, I don't believe Jesus came to this earth and was born of a virgin. Let's see what Matthew has to say about it, amen? Let's go talk to Mark. Mark knows a little bit more, amen? You never go wrong with the words inside this page. And the Spirit and the Word will never disagree, and the Word, Jesus, the living Word, and, and, and the written Word will never disagree because Jesus is the living Word and He is the written Word. Amen? They're one. The Father, Son, and the Holy Ghost, they're one. You don't separate God from his word. It's a great foundation, my friend. Never leave your foundation. The Bible says that what, what, what happens when, when, when we uh, allow the foundations to be eroded, that, it, that, that we are destroyed, amen? You never leave your foundation. When we leave our foundation, we're in deep trouble. And the problem is, you could be right here and you can go wherever Dude North is. I'm not, I know it's somewhere that way. But if you start here and say, I'm going to the North Pole, and you deviate that much, you'll be miles and miles away from it when you reach there. Folks, I want my eye on the prize. I want my eye on Jesus. Amen? I want him, when, when I stand before him, I want him to say, well done, thou good and faithful servant. How about you? Amen? Let's give him a hand clap and a shout. Amen? Hallelujah! We can count on his word this morning, my friend. Hallelujah. Jesus became the full and final sacrifice. No more bulls, no more goats for sacrifice. The full and final sacrifice. Thank God. Hallelujah. The thing about the Jerusalem church is they wanted the kingdom without the king. I don't know about you, but I want the king. I want the kingdom, but I want the king. Amen. I am thank God for the healing but I thank God for the healer. Amen? I thank God that he blesses us financially. I thank God for his financial blessings, but I thank God for Jehovah Jireh, the God my provider. Amen? I thank God that he is my shepherd. I thank God that he leads me, guides me, and directs me. I thank God that his is the voice I listen to, and none other will I yield and listen to. When he calls, I come. When he tells me to go, I go. Amen? Jesus is the word. 
He is the word. We can no more separate Jesus from the word than we can separate him from the father. What man says may be, but what God says is. You can count on it. I can get behind a pulpit or I can talk to you in private and I may miss, misspeak, but God never misspeaks. This is God's voice speaking to us. We can settle on the integrity of the word of God. And we need to make the word of God ours and act on it. Think about that this morning. We need to make this word ours. Let it become part of us. The Bible says there are great, many great and precious promises. I want you to repeat after me. I am who the word says I am. I have what the word says I have. I am a king and I'm a prince. I'm an heir of God. Join heirs with Jesus Christ. Seated with him in heavenly places. I am the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. Hallelujah. Let's give him another shout. Amen. Woo, glory. Hallelujah. Glory. Hallelujah. If my leg wasn't so sore, I'd probably take off and run. But I'm telling you what, I'm about to have a good old-fashioned Pentecostal fit up here. God is our hope and our help, church. Woo, glory. He's risen us up from the miry clay. We are not some worm in the dust. He loves us. I don't think God's going to have a whole bunch of worms in the dust in heaven. The Bible tells us that if we humble ourselves under the mighty hand of God, that he will exalt us. Well, yeah, I know what humbling is, brother. Humbling is that I'm an old worm. I'm nothing. I have nothing. I've never had nothing. I'll never have nothing. Then why in the world do you even go to work to try to earn a living, my friend? I mean, we, know, I mean, we put on this religious facade because it looks good, but it stinks in the nostrils of God. We are, how do we humble ourselves? By lining ourselves up with the word of God. And the Bible says that we can be exalted, but he does the exalting. We're not to exalt ourselves. Let us, him, exalt us in due time. Amen? I'm a king and I'm a priest. I'm the righteousness of God. Well, doesn't the Bible say there's none righteous? No, not one. Read the rest of the scripture. Read the rest of the verses around it. God, uh, we, we, you are righteous, my friend. And, and, and sometimes we say things like that. I, I remember I was, I, I was teaching a small group, and, and I made the comment. I said, do you realize you'll never be any more righteous than you are now? And I went, in he you'll never be any more righteous in heaven than you are now. And I heard this, <gasps> well, I don't think God is going to let unrighteous people into heaven. You're bought with the blood, my friend. Amen. I said, we're bought with the blood. You think the blood washed out 99.9% .9 of our unrighteousness, but there's that one-tenth of one percent that has to be taken care of when we enter the heaven? No. We are righteous. We got God living in us. You think God is going to dwell in some unrighteous, ungodly thing? No. He has recreated us in his likeness, in his image. Amen? We are children and priests of God. Humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God. Don't let religion cheat you out of what is rightfully yours. Hallelujah. Amen. Hallelujah. Jesus approached all the works of the enemy in his earthly ministry with the same ferocity as he had compassion for those who were sick. Think about that. He had compassion for the sick. He hated the devil. And he came after those who tried to twist the word and keep people in bondage. God's word is final authority, and it will stand the test of time. Matthew 24, 35, the Lord Jesus Christ said, Heaven and earth shall pass away, but my word shall not pass away. The enemy is out to steal the word, to stamp it out. But as I was writing, uh, as I was originally studying this message, God started speaking to me, and I had these Holy Ghost notes. You know about Holy Ghost notes in this church, don't we? And I was tapping, uh, typing, I was tapping. I was tapping, but I was typing as fast as God was pouring it in. I want you to listen to this. Get your, you ready to get your shouting clothes on, my friend? Hell cannot stamp it out. Hallelujah. Denominations cannot water it down. Governments cannot legislate it away. 
Atheists cannot argue it away. Secular humanists cannot reason it away. And carnal Christians cannot compromise it away. Hallelujah. Let's get our shouting clothes on. Woo, glory. Hallelujah. I'm about to take them running. I'm running. <laughs> no, I got a sore leg. I'm about to take them running. Glory. Woo, glory. I say glory. Hallelujah. Woo, glory. Glory, hallelujah. And this is the resolve that we've got to have as a church, my friend. You can see right now, there are forces outside, what we would call outside the church. But my friend, there are forces within the church. I, I was watching a, a minister I, I, on a podcast on YouTube, and he was talking about churches over in Europe. And he was talking about churches that once proclaimed, like in Great Britain, and churches that once proclaimed the word of God that would had churches filled with people are now just down to a handful of people. Just like the church of Jerusalem, they were one generation away from falling into tradition and losing that power and that zeal for God. He said, you got churches over there that have been transformed into seat temples, what we call flea markets or bazaars, mosques, all sorts of things for the world. And you know the reason why is they got off the word. They got away from the word. We've got denominations splitting today because they got off the word. See, see, we look at the thing and we think the thing that is happening is the problem. And it is a problem. But it's not the source of the problem. The source of the problem is getting off the word of God. I want you to think about this this morning. You go over the same podcast we're talking about, go over to New England, and you'll see churches that have been around since the founding of this country or shortly thereafter, and what used to proclaim the word of God now have pride flags flying over them, and they become nothing more than, than, than social gatherings. Let me tell you something, my friend. If this is nothing more than a social gathering, I'm going to the house. i got better things to do. I don't need you to come in here and show you how pretty my clothes are this morning. I need to show you how wonderful my Savior is this morning. Amen? I want to proclaim of his goodness, my friend. I want to proclaim that he's my healer and he's my deliverer. I want, to, I want to proclaim that despise what is going on, maybe going on in my life, he is my answer, and I'm standing on the solid rock this morning. I don't know about you, my friend. I'm going to come to the house of God and worship him and get the unadulterated truth of the word of God. Amen? Amen. Hallelujah. 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 Yeah. Praise his holy name. Blessed be the name of the Lord God forevermore. Praise you, Lord Jesus. We got churches that have formed committees, denomination forming committees. Let me tell you something. I am licensed, credentialed through the Church of God Cleveland. If the Church of God Cleveland ever even allowed somebody to speak from the floor about allowing homosexuality into the churches and into the clergy, you know how fast that they would have my credentials back? That quick. That quick. We're not going to compromise on the word of God. Now, we're going to love people. Yeah. And folks, we've got to love people. I mean, like I said earlier, this is a different time than it was 30 years ago, 20 years, 10 years ago. You better, we better have as a church to open our doors to the drug addict, yeah. to what we would call the deviant. Maybe somebody's going through transitioning. Folks, we never even thought about it. This stuff wasn't even thought about in churches. But let me tell you something, as the world gets darker, our light is going to shine brighter, and it's going to be a beacon call to people. And we better allow them. Now, we, I, you won't allow them in your pulpit, and they won't teach your children, and they won't be leaders until they get born again and get some word in them. But we, we better allow them in the door and love on them. Amen? We better be a church that loves the unlovely and the ungodly. And realize there are people that are hurting, and they're looking for answers. That's why all this goofiness is going on. But let me tell you something, my friend. The reason why you got denominations allowing this stuff is because they have gotten off the word of God, as I said a moment ago. They get ballots, and I don't care. You, you, could, get, you, you could chop down every tree in the universe, make a paper ballot on it, and we're going to accept 
homosexuality. We're going to accept lesbianism. And this is not really the word of God. It's really sort of a, an amalgamation of what people thought. And they were trapped in their own prejudice. I've heard all this garbage. My friend, this is the word of God. I don't care if they mow down every tree and turn it into a paper ballot. It's not going to change God's mind just because they decide to. And I believe that we are in a shaking in the church. My word, I believe that's a prophetic word. We are in a shaking in the church. God is winnowing out those who are true and stand and those who are going to fall. Because in these days, whatever you have on the inside of you, when the pressure comes, it's like a sponge. You put a sponge in clear water and you bring it out and you squeeze it, put the pressure on it, what comes out? the clear water. If you stick it into a bucket of mud and you pull it out of a bucket of mud and you squeeze on it, you know what's going to come out? Mud. My friend, the time to get the word of God in us is before the pressure comes. The time to get the word of God in us is before that need hits. The time to get the word of God in us is before the enemy tries to steal your babies. The time to get the word of God in you is before the sickness comes. And that way, when the enemy comes with his barrel of junk that he has, you can stand tall on the word and be able to speak it because it's in here. And when the pressure comes, that's what comes out. Amen? Well, you can never tell what God's going to do. I know what God's going to do. He's already told us in his word. And if we got his word in us, we would know that. But what if everybody gets together and they decide... Well, Brother James, why don't they get together? And they outlaw these things that you're talking about. I, I've told people in our home church, I said, I'm not that easy to find, my friend. Just go down here in the square, here in Birdstown, during the week, come to the house, come to Alive in the Spirit, or unless I'm preaching somewhere else like here, maybe on my way to Cookville or Somerset, somewhere in between. I'm not that hard to find. Arrest me, because I'm not changing the Word of God. I've often told people, I'll go to jail. For, I won't go to jail for you, but I'll go to jail for the gospel. Amen? I'd rather have a prison cell than go to hell. How's that sound? Amen? I'm not changing. Thank God you're in a church that isn't going to change. We come back to the Word. The Word is our, is our platform. Amen? The Word is our standard. The Word is our sure foundation. Well, what if everybody, what if everybody in that denomination decides to vote on it? What if everybody votes on it? I don't care. I, I, I don't care if you vote on it and you pass it and you start doing the old backpack and you start patting each other's back until there's a hole worn in your shirt. God ain't going to go off his word. He, he, he's not bound. He, he's only bound by his word. That's why we got to come, we, we got to be conformed to the image of his dear son. His dear son doesn't conform to us, my friend. We'd have 100,000 different Jesuses, five different, seven trillion different Jesuses. My friend, there's only one Jesus and we conform to him. He doesn't conform to us. Amen? Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. He's calling us to come up higher, church. Amen. I said, he's calling us to come up higher. So I'm coming up higher. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Well, there was a time, my friend, that everybody in the world did, uh, did, did depart from the faith. Turn with me, if you would, to the book of Genesis chapter 3. Well, we got this committee together. We all agreed in harmony and 100% and I, I don't care. I, I don't care what you agree. Unless it's the word of God, then I'll care. We're going to take a look at the first eight verses of the book of uh, Genesis chapter 3. Because there was a time that everybody in the world did vote. And let's see what happened. Now the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field which the Lord God has made. And he said unto the woman, Yea, hath God said, Ye shall not eat of every tree of the garden. And the woman said unto the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden, but of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God has said, Ye shall not eat of it, neither shall ye touch it, lest ye die. Now, did God actually say that? God didn't say, let, let me share something with you. God didn't tell them that they couldn't touch it. See, we, we do what I call, we'll pause here for a minute. Let's just park here for a minute. We do what we call meology. See, theology is the study of God and the things of God. You know what meology is? It's my interpretation of what God said. 
Now, now when you're on theology, you're on good ground. When you start getting muddled into meology, buddy, we better back up and do a, a check in the mirror and use this Bible as a mirror and check to see if we line up if something's wrong. Amen? Now, I, I, I'll add on to that here, that thought in just a second. And the serpent said to the woman, you shall not surely die. For God does know that in the day you eat thereof, then your eyes shall be opened and you shall be, uh, be as gods, knowing good and evil. And when the woman saw that the tree was good for food and that it was pleasant for the eyes and a tree desired to make one wise, she took of the fruit thereof and did eat and gave it to her husband also with her and he did eat. And the eyes of both of them were opened and they knew that they were naked and they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves aprons. And when the they heard the voice of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day and Adam and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God amongst the trees of the garden. Up until this moment, Adam and Eve were in a perfect, sinless state. Okay? This is going to help us. Here's some of that meology I was referring to a moment ago. I, I come up with this crazy idea when I was a kid. Now, I kind of grew out of it when I became an adult, but nobody taught me this. Have you ever taught yourself something and found out what was wrong and no one taught you? See, well, see what, what I thought. Now, here's, here, here's me. Eve's over here. She's over here by this tree. Now, she had no business being by that tree. Now, God, see, the twisting of the word of God, God did not say, if you touch it, you'll die. He said, if you eat it, you'll die. So he did twist the word of God. It's what the devil does today. Adam and Eve, they thought they knew better than God. There, there's your reasoning. There's your human, uh, your, your human reasoning, your humanism. They denied what God had to say. Got off the, you know, got into what we would call liberal theology. She's, this is what I thought. She's over here. Oh, my word, there's that tree. And there's a serpent up there in that tree. Here, Eve, eat of this. She takes the fruit, eats it, goes back. Poor old Adam over here. He has no idea what's going on. Now, this is what I'm thinking. He's over here tilling the garden. He comes home. Hey, honey, how you doing? Hey, baby, how you doing today? Hey, I'm doing great. Well, what's for dinner? Well, you know that tree that God told us not to eat? Here. What? That's not what the Bible says. I, I was up one night, and God was speaking to me about this pastor scripture, and I think it's going to help us. The Bible says, grab a hold. Adam was standing right there with Eve. She grabbed the fruit, took it, turned to her husband, he took the fruit, and he ate it. Now here's the picture of what really happened. Adam just standing there. You got the devil over here, the serpent, and Eve talking. Just going back and forth. Hey, 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 yeah, boy, that fruit looks good. Yeah, 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 yeah. The devil came into their home. And you know what Adam did? He ceded his spiritual authority over to his wife. Now, that's not popular to say. That's not, that's not politically correct today. I don't care what's politically correct. Husbands, you are the priests of your home. I said you are the priests of your home. The, the devil comes around in your home and starts uh, messing around with your family. It is your responsibility to get him out of your home. Thank God for that many of the wise have had to stand up and do it. And God will honor it, but it's not God's best. Amen? It, is, it was Adam's responsibility to get that thing out of the garden and cast it out. And he didn't do it. And as a result, we got the mess that we've got today. Amen? Everyone in the world voted. Didn't change God's opinion, did it? <laughs> well, hey, we voted, God. I don't care what you did. My word stands forever. And God had spoken the word directly to Adam. Adam got it directly from God himself. Now listen to what I'm saying. Yeah, I think it's going to help you. Even in that perfect state, listen, this is where, Christian, this is where some believers are getting off today. Listen to me. Listen to me. I'm not trying to belabor the point just to belabor it. This is important. 
This is where some, some believers are getting off today. They want to delegate everything to the devil. And the devil is the source of all evil. I'm not going to say that. But even in that perfect state, it was their flesh and their soul that they were responsible for keeping under. Even when they were not fallen, their flesh and their soul wanted to do something. They needed to exercise the authority over the enemy that they had. He's under our feet, church. They didn't need a deliverance service. They needed to walk in the authority of what they already have. And some people are looking to rub it in, rub it on, cast it in, cast it out. They're wanting some quick fix when God says that we are the head and we're not the tail. We are above and not beneath. I am blessed in the city. I'm blessed in the field. Everything that I put my hand to prospers, thank God. I'm the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. No devil. That sickness has no right on my baby's body. It has no right in my wife's body. It has no right in my body. And in Jesus' name, I am the healed of the Lord. I'm not going to compromise the word of God because of pressure. I'm going to think upon things which are good and lovely and of good report. If there be any virtue, if there be any praise, I'm going to think on those things. Hallelujah. Because the things that we meditate on in life, the things that we concentrate on in life will be magnified in life, as we said at the onset. Let me tell you something. If all, we got a whole, oh, I hope it's okay I say this. We got a whole slew of people out there going out the, and they're spending their entire day thinking about the devil, trying to cast the devil out, looking for the devil, this about the devil, that about the devil. The devil exists, okay? We have authority over him, but I want to concentrate on the Word of God. I want to concentrate on his goodness. I'm going to walk this thing out. And if I've got a problem in life, I've got the Holy Ghost on the inside of me, leading me, guiding me, and directing me. Woo, glory. That deserves a rousing amen if you ask me. Amen. We're victorious because we have his word. We need to walk some things out, and they should have walked it out. And even in that perfect state, they needed to keep their flesh and that flesh nature in line. My friend, our whole purpose is to fellowship and communicate with God and to glorify him. I'll tell this story as I begin to close. Uh, back when I was supposed to go in for my outpatient, for my defibrillator pacemaker, uh, I had to go to the cardiologist and, you know, for the instructions from the nurse. You do this three days before, two days before, one day before. You don't take this. You do take that. You don't eat. You brush your teeth. You scrub your, your tongue. You probably know all this stuff. I'm like, oh, my word. What am I, three years old? And then you report here at 6 or 7 o'clock in the morning. I'm like, you mean 6 comes twice a day? And uh, <laughs> that means I got to get up at 3, 30, 4 o'clock? Uh, and I can't eat? I can't drink? Can't do nothing? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, and some people say that, I don't know, maybe a couple of you who know me personally, I've been told I'm funny. Is, is that true? My wife's going, <laughs> I've been told I've got a sense of humor, okay? So the nurse... And I'm going to tell a funny story, but it's not for the sake of just being funny. It's going to have a spiritual bend here in just a second. I hope it's helping you out. The nurse and I are sitting there, and we're just cracking wise with each other. I mean, we're just cracking back and forth. And she keeps patting my leg like this. My wife's sitting there. She's patting my leg. We're sitting down there. And she kept rocking back and forth. She'd tell a joke. I'd tell a joke. Laughing back and forth, laughing. Had her almost rolled. She was literally rocking back and forth in her chair. We got up to leave. My wife says, she thought you were funny. I said, well, yeah, you know, I'm a funny guy. You know, <laughs> what do you expect? And uh, I said, now, now here's where it's going to start turning serious in just a second. I said, well, you know, there was a time that someone like that who's pretty and young, I would have thought, are they flirting with me? And I thought, no, they just, she just thinks I remind her of her dad. That's what 40 years will get you, Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I, was, I, I don't have that much hubris and, and pride and arrogance to think that someone in their 20s would be interested in me that way. Okay, so, but here, here's what I said in the, next ver in the next breath. I said, but here's what 40 years will get you. It'll get you a little bit of experience and it'll get you a little bit of wisdom. The devil has nothing new in his arsenal, my friend. 
When I went to Ramah back in 1985, when I went to Ramah, Brother Kenneth E. Hagan, he was around his 50th year in ministry at that time. He said, all these things you've seen, I've seen them all before. And here I am, 20 years old, about to turn 21 in a few months going, wow, 50 years of ministry, I'll never get that old. Here I, here I'm getting there. <laughs> oh, boy, that was not a good, that was not a true prophecy. I'm, I'm there, okay? <laughs> and I can honestly say that... 41 years ago, I got into what is now known as the charismatic ministry, uh, movement. First message I ever heard was by Kenneth Copeland on the blood covenant. I went, oh my word, I never heard anything like this. Anything you need from God is yours because it's yours. And anything God needs from you is, your, is his because you're in this covenant. I went, oh, I never heard anything. It changed my life. Second message I heard was from Marilyn Hickey. And she was talking about being destined for the throne. Here was this little shepherd boy that was just cast out because nobody thought he was that important. And, and he was faithful with what he was given to shepherd these sheep and he ministered to the Lord and God made him a king. He was destined for, for the throne. And I went, oh, never heard such a thing. So I've been around a little while. Now I did backslide, but I always had my ear to the ground to what was going on in the church. Let me tell you something, the things that we've seen, hyper grace that came out a few years ago, I seen that back in the 80s. Now, it was dressed up a little bit different. Everything that you see now, I saw them back then. That's what 40 years get you. And let me tell you something, it ain't got any more biblical now than it was then because of social media and people liking stuff. Honey, you can put something on, the, on, on your Facebook and everybody in the world will like it, and if it's biblically wrong, it's wrong, okay? Having followers doesn't mean it's right, okay? Now, I'm thankful for social media and what it can do, but there's a lot of garbage out there. We've got to be careful. Amen? So let me tell you this. I had this conversation when I was backslid. It was about a month before I came back to the Lord. Is it okay if I share this? Okay. I think it's going to help us come back to the Word. When I was in Ramah, they told us when anybody comes at you with anything, you bring me back to the Word. These Mormon missionaries... Uh, I had met him through my uncle. If, if you knew my uncle, you would know that he just he was just a friend to everybody. He, if, if he met you and you were new in town, he'd t take you on a personal tour of everything in three counties around. He was just that kind of guy. And he would befriend all these Mormon missionaries, not because he's being sucked into their doctrine, just because he wanted friends. And these were nice guys. And so they were over at his house, and I was over at his house, and they had they come to proselytize me. They thought I need, which I did, but not by them. Okay, and so they were, we were, I was sitting on a couch, and they were sitting on, in, in, in a couple chairs, and they had their King James Bible, same one I just preached out of this morning, on the left knee. They had their Book of Mormon on the right knee, and they said, well, if you try to proselytize me now, and I'm backslid. Point to the, if you read this scripture here, then you go over to this book over here. And I said, wait a minute. I said, out of the mouth of two or three witnesses, let a word be established. So you're going to have to show me out of the, out of the New Testament in the King James here, because that's what they had, three things that support your book over here. Well, just read this. I said, I'm not reading anything. Show me. Well, you, you know, Joseph Smith saw God. I said, now, this is the days before the Internet, okay, that, as we know it now. It hadn't matured. It was still in its infancy. So it's not like even Google existed, okay? You're, you, you, but I had known enough about the Mormon doctrine to know that even Joseph Smith said that he didn't see God. He saw an angel. But they, they opened that door, walked through it, so I thought I'd follow him in there. I said, no, he didn't see God. Oh, yes, he did. I said, he didn't see God. I said, did you ever read in the Bible where Moses wanted to see God in his glory? And Mo God said, no man can look upon my face and live. And so he put him in the cleft of the rock and he covered the rock up. And, and he, he, he said, I'm going to turn around. I'm going to pass by that cleft. And you can open your eyes and see my backside, but you can't look upon my glory. I said, no man can see. Well, maybe it wasn't God. I'm thinking, yeah, it wasn't God, all right. Maybe... It, 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 it was Jesus. And so I said, well, there's another scripture in the Bible that, I, that I'd like to quote you. And I, 
I typed it out because I wanted to make sure that I didn't misquote it in all my excitement here this morning. I said, Galatians 1.8, But though we or an angel from heaven preach any other gospel unto you than that which we have preached unto you, let him be accursed. Paul said, if I even come back around and I preach something weird or different than what you've been preaching, I'm accursed. Listen, folks, I'm not perfect. I can miss it. You can miss it. And when we miss it, and I'm talking about on heaven and hell things, the Bible says we're cursed. And so then I stopped and I looked at him. I said, and remember, I, I mean, I was, you know, I was backslid. I was trying to be nice, but I said, you know what I really don't like about your old religion and your old doctrine? And they said, what? I said, listen to this. Grab a hold of this. I said, I don't like the fact that you teach people that one day they'll be a god and have their own planet to be God over. Their eyes got about that big. They said, listen to what I'm about to say. This is what this young man told me. Oh my word, he said, we don't tell people that part from the first. I said, you don't? Let me tell you something, church. Let me tell you something. When you come to a church that is on fire for God and standing on the word, we tell you that there's a heaven to gain and a hell to shun like the old-fashioned preachers. We tell you the end from the beginning. We don't hide anything from you. Amen? And I looked at them and I said, my life's a mess enough. I can't even run my own life. How in the world am I supposed to run a planet? I had one amen. Any more amen? <laughs> and more, almost 30 years later, I still don't want to run a planet. And I know a whole lot more now than I know then. I hope this has helped you this morning. Amen? Let's go ahead and go to the Lord in prayer this morning.